All right. All right. Um, so I'm probably going to try to cover quite a bit of ground during this stream, but um, I just mainly kind of want to give a brief overview of how I'm approaching um, doing some web development lately using NIM. And um, I'll try to write some code, probably towards the end of this stream. But um, I kind of want to just start giving an overview of uh, of how I'm structuring my my web projects using them. Um, I do work um, professionally um, as a web developer, so um, I'm kind of glued in whether I like it or not into the the javascript um react world i guess you could you could say or you could call it rather um so generally on a day-to-day -day basis i'm using like react babel or babel um you know npm um tools like that um I've kind of migrated away from Webpack lately and moved to um, Parcel.js, which is another bundler. I'm not sure if you've heard of it, so um, I'll be showing that. Um, you know, I do have <clears throat> some aversion to using all of these technologies and all of these tools, but unfortunately, um, given some of the, uh, the ECMAScript um, or Amicascript, or I think it's ECMAScript, right? Um, 
specifications that uh, I'm trying to use because um, I've been playing with like web components and custom elements and things like that lately. Um, I have to uh, I have to kind of um, transpile some uh, JavaScript or ECMAScript into uh, into JavaScript. So I'll cover uh, a bit of what I'm doing there. Um, that involved writing some libraries. Another uh, concept I wanted to explore was um, so there's this library called HyperHTML. I'll send out a link in chat real quick. Um, so the author of this library tries to uh, make the claim that it's a uh, to more performant than React, but um, I I haven't found any benchmarks. But I don't really think that's the draw of it. I think it's um it's kind of a library that takes a different approach to how it uh, deals with uh, with presentation layer rendering. Um, instead of using a traditional, well, I guess now traditional uh, virtual uh, virtual DOM. With DOM diffing, um, it uses this new concept that was introduced recently, and I'll send out a link for this too. One minute, please. Okay, so um, template literals are, they basically allow you just uh, interpolate JavaScript expressions inside of uh, string values. But the cool thing about tag template literals is um, you can tag those template literals with a, with a function. Um, and then that basically allows you to, to bind context, essentially. And when that expression is interpolated, um, or evaluated, you can um, you can do things. So what HyperHTML does is instead of uh, constructing a virtual DOM and then you know blowing away the UI state and diffing uh, a copy of the virtual DOM against you know the new the new frames virtual DOM and then um, using that to manipulate the the actual DOM. HyperHTML uh, basically tags uh, template literals uh, that have dynamic content in them. And when that dynamic content changes, HyperHTML just uh, applies that one DOM manipulation or that one DOM update. So uh, I wanted to explore alternatives to React and frameworks like Vue and uh, Marco.js and things like that that have been, you know, using this more traditional method of DOM diffing and, and manipulating the DOM that way. So I wrote a port of um, HyperHTML and it's still very much a work in progress, but um, that's what's up here in this folder called lits. Um, NES or NES um, is a, just basically like an ECMAScript um, macro um, for producing uh, ES 2015 classes and, um, and those are a prerequisite to writing custom elements uh, which was part of like the web component spec um, so I'm using all this to do a couple things like one thing is build a um, build a personal like you know, uh, website or CV site where I can post my resume. Um, and then, well, I was using it for a project at work, but um, that's no longer in the pipe. So I'm hopefully going to be using the, the new libraries on the, uh, the new iteration of the NIM Playground that I've been constantly, you know, starting and then rewriting. But um, Assuming this all works out, I'll be continuing uh, that way. But I'll be talking about stuff that should be applicable outside of <clears throat> um, these libraries too. So as long as you're using them in the you know web development capacity, um, 
some of this should be useful to you. So I'm going to start out with uh, the project's nimble file. If you're not using nimble, um, you know you can tune out for this part. But um, you know nimble is Nim's package management tool. Um, there's alternatives. Uh, I think Iraq uh, has one called like Nawabs or Noabs, um, N A W A B S. Um, I'm using Nimble, and you, you know, it, I'm not really using this Nimble or this uh, Nimble for this project because I plan on publishing this project. It's more because I need dependencies, and I like to use Nimble's Nim uh, Nimble develop feature sometimes. Um, I'm also using it for defining tasks, um, kind of like you would do with like a package.json file. Um, I think the eventual goal here would be to figure out a way to handle JavaScript dependencies somehow and like not have to use, you know, package.json. Um, I mean, I know of course you can just like use like a CDN and load your JavaScript that way. But if you're doing any kind of work with like uh, with Babel or Babel or whatever, um, I think that bundlers, uh, you know, are kind of, well, they're not necessary, you know, they're either, but I don't know. I guess I'm kind of on the fence about bundlers and whether you need them at all. But um, either way, like getting, you know, JavaScript dependencies without NPM is a pain. Um, if you if you want to tie into that whole ecosystem, and uh, and Nim doesn't have a great way to do it right now, so I'm forced kind of into this world of using package.json and npm for JavaScript dependencies and Nimble for uh, Nim dependencies. But anyway, um, so I'm using um, development tree of Nim as of you know, I think yesterday is when I last updated. Um, so I learned a couple tricks um, when I was first starting to do web development with Nim, and that is you can kind of take advantage of some of Nimble's, um, I guess, like the the options it introduces and uh, use them for the JavaScript backend too. So the first one is just setting the backend to JavaScript. Um, so I've seen a lot of JavaScript projects that don't do this and are using Nimble. Um, but this is an easy way to get Nimble to just run Nim.js instead of uh, Nim.c when you do things like Nimble install or Nimble build, things like that. Um, you can also like set a bin directory to like public.js or you know, dist or wherever you normally when you're doing like web traditional web projects, uh, I'll put your JavaScript file. Another thing you can do is um, you can put a bin option in there, and for any Nim file that you want to compile into uh, a JavaScript file, you can add an entry to this sequence. It is a sequence, so you know you can just comma delineate and add entries. Um, so all those things are kind of nice. Um, for being able to use Nimble and get it to behave in a way that, you know, it's not just kind of throwing the C, the default C options at you. Um, so this is just requiring that, uh, that project that I mentioned earlier. Um, and we'll go into that in a little bit. Um, not too, not too in depth, but just kind of explain what it does uh, in a bit more detail. Okay, so, um, this is the only task I've really defined so far. Um, I've kind of, I haven't found a great way to get Nimble developed to, well, there's a couple things here. Because because I have two, and if anyone has suggestions for this, please feel free to um, guide me and, and share with everybody how you're handling this. But um, since I have these two libraries um, locally not on my machine, um, Nimble develop can work, but I think Nimble Develop generally wants a either a Nimble package or like a, a Git URL or Git hash or something. Um, so the main problem is when I when I change these libraries um, and I recompile my code, that's fine. But um, 
if I'm doing any kind of, um, I guess, watching on these directories, uh, or sorry, if I do any changes and I'm like watching this project and hot reloading it, I haven't, I haven't figured out a great way yet without just like adding tons and tons of statements to this watch command, um, to, to watch the, uh, the dependent libraries. Sorry if my dog's barking, um, or starts barking rather. Um, watching the dependent libraries and having my hot module reloading kick in, but um, I don't know. That's that's something I'm still working through, and I'm trying to find a cleaner or a clean way to do it without just having to keep constantly refreshing a list of dependencies. But um, oh, and that's another thing. Like a couple, I don't know what release it was in, but um, I know that uh, Za or Zach. Zachary or Zahari, or, um, I'm sorry if I'm butchering his name, but he's one of the uh, guys that contributes a lot to the NIM compiler. And um, I think he put in a PR for hot module reloading. I found it like a couple months ago just searching for HMR and hot module reloading in the NIM repository for like tests and stuff. But uh, you can now hot module reload with NIM, and it's, it's really not that difficult. So uh, I'll go over now that real quick because that's something that everyone generally wants to set up pretty early in their project. So a um, couple things about this watch command. I'm just using the um, the exact tasks that, that's built into NimScript. Um, and then I'm importing the, the string details module up here just to do some formatting. So um, I'm using a package called concurrently. Um, and if we open up this pack, I'll just, uh, because I'm streaming, let me try to do something real quick. Okay, hopefully, can, let's see. Yeah, I'm not going to mess with it right now. Um, okay, so yeah, you can see the package is installed right here. Um, and I think the other NPM package we're going to be using is Shockabar, which is right here. It's just a CLI tool. And most of these are dev dependencies, which means that, so if you've never used NPM or package.json before, First of all, I'm really surprised you're watching this. But second of all, um, the um, give me one moment, please. I'm gonna let my dog out of the room. Sorry about that. Um, but uh, the difference between dev dependencies and dependencies or like uh, development dependencies are things that you would use during, you know, building, compiling your code, um, anything that wouldn't really be used in, in runtime. Um, so parcel is another package we're using and that's right here, parcel bundler. Um, and if you guys want me to send out links to any of this stuff, just let me know I can. Um, and I'll also publish this project. I, it's not done yet. It's not really doing anything, but maybe we'll change some of that in a little bit. And um, I'll throw it up on GitHub. Okay, so with uh, concurrently, um, you can specify names for tasks here. So I'm going to have a task to build the app, um, to watch NIM source files, um, to watch uh, Tailwind. Um, or at, this is really for CSS files to run Tailwind CSS on them. Um, Tailwind CSS is like a post CSS framework. Um, it's it's kind of like Bootstrap in that it's um I'm trying to remember the name of uh, that style of CSS where they have like a lot oh utility uh, based CSS where everything's like kind of like a utility class, but it has a lot of sugar on top of that like syntactic sugar where you can like define like elements or I guess just like reusable CSS um, and then of course you can use all the traditional post CSS plugins with it so it's pretty powerful um, and it allows you to like really quickly prototype and, and kind of build UIs and I'll, I'll try to um, shine a little light on that later 
then we're going to have a task for bundling our JavaScript using parcel. And then finally, we'll have a task for running um, a little browser sync utility, um, just basically to serve up like browser sync. Um, OK, so the build task just uses the min um, binary and uses the JavaScript target. Um, so here's that hot reloading feature I was talking about earlier that you can turn on with this hot reloading flag. Uh, so that's pretty new, I think. Um, and then I'm putting the nim cache into um, this public JavaScript directory here. Um, and the reason I'm doing that is because that's going to get watched um, so that when, they, actually, sorry, that's going to get loaded by this index.html file right here. And then that file is basically going to be watched by parcel. So whenever that file changes, the idea is parcel will re reload the, um, the entire project, or sorry, rebuild the, the bundle. Um, OK, now we have an out directive. Um, and that's basically just saying like what to call the JavaScript file. Um, and then we're pointing to this main.nim file in the source directory right here. Um, so Chakadar is kind of like a watch tool. Um, hold on one second, I'm gonna close the door. Okay, and um, we're just going to watch for any NIM files that'll change uh, in the source directory and any um, subdirectories. And when those do change, we're going to run a command to uh, recompile them again, basically using the same command we did above. Um, and that's actually probably problematic and, and not really making a ton of sense because um, I should really be replacing main here with whatever the file argument, or sorry, the file name is from the file that changes. I know you can do that with this tool, um, so that's something I have to do. Um, kind of the same thing here with the CSS. This isn't as problematic because um, I mean it still is. I should be doing the same thing. I think the I think the reason. I took this shortcut and just left it and it's been working out okay is that most of my job I only really have one entry point to my JavaScript but if you have multiple entry points and you know you want to compile um, you don't want to just compile one you know tree of JavaScript then it's it's going to be problematic um, okay so here I'm um, I'm running parcel and um, the idea of the way parcel works is it's it's supposed to be kind of like configuration free bundling, I guess, um, as opposed to Webpack where you have a config file parcel, you don't actually need any configuration file most of the time. Um, you just point it at an index.html file and parcels generally most of the time smart enough to, to figure out how to bundle your, your JavaScript. So inside this index.html file <clears throat> um, I just ignore most of this for now um, these are the important tags down here, these script tags uh, and the first one's not even important right now what, this is basically a polyfill for some of the, um, the web component uh, specification stuff like the custom elements we're going to be doing later or talking about later um, so don't worry about that right now, but here you can see um, this is where I'm loading the, the JavaScript that gets compiled by, by that watch task I showed you earlier. And then this is to enable um, hot module reloading with browser sync. So let's go back to the nimble file again. Um, yeah, I think that's I think that's pretty much it for what that watch task does. Um, so I'm gonna delete this. It's not needed. Okay, so I'll talk about Babel real quick. Um, if you're not familiar with Babel, um, it's a 
basically it's a a transpiler that allows you to use future specifications of JavaScript that haven't been released yet officially. So browsers browser support for them is varied. Um, you know, Chrome will support certain features, but Firefox won't, and IE is generally the one that lags behind the worst. Um, but as these specifications get nailed down and JavaScript becomes, I mean, most of these specifications anyway are really just like syntactic sugar. For instance, the classes we're going to be looking at later are actually just functions under the, under the hood. But um, yeah, for whatever reason, this is the way JavaScript decides to run itself, the JavaScript world. Um, and um, basically, this tool allows us to take advantage of these newer JavaScript features. And the transpiler or the tool will spit out JavaScript that the browser can handle. Um, so we're going to be using, the reason I have decorators is here is because I was playing with around the MobX, um, which is a state management framework that has become pretty popular. Um, so if you're building like a more complex web app um, where you have a lot of application state floating around and you want a nice way to, to kind of clean it up and keep it, um, keep it from, you know, keep your app from turning into spaghetti code, I guess, essentially. Um, a lot of people use things like Redux or Alt. JS was a popular one. But MobX has kind of um, emerged as a hot new one that a lot of people are playing with. So I was uh, playing around with, uh, first of all, just getting like decorators working. Um, and then second of all, playing with MobX. So that's why that's in here. Um, in fact, I think that's probably why a lot of these things are in here. Actually, no, the, sorry, these last two um, are for class, I should just read, class properties. So um, if you're trying to define properties on ES 2015 or ES6 classes, you probably need this transform. And the same thing with custom elements. Um, if you're using ES 2015 or ES6 classes, again, to build custom elements, uh, you're probably going to need this uh, transform plugin for Babel. Uh, and you'll also need the ES 2015 preset and the stage zero preset for this stuff, I believe. Okay. Um, so I guess let's go ahead and look at, let's think here, let's, let's look at some moon code. Um, I think that's why most people are here anyway. Um, Okay, so a lot of this stuff is very, very much a work in progress in terms of the uh, the libraries that in the macro or the library and the macro that I talked about at the very beginning of the stream. Um, so, if you have any feedback or suggestions on how to improve or um, you know how you would do this, um, please feel free to you know leave those comments. Um, in the uh, in the text. Oh, sorry, I haven't been paying attention at all to the chat. Um, uh, Stephanos eighty two. I am uh, talking about basically like building web applications with Min, and um, if you haven't caught on already, and um, it's kind of some of the uh, the ways I use like modern JavaScript tooling with Min, and um, and kind of how I have been approaching uh, building the front end of a of a new web application. Okay, so um, yeah, the uh, the NES ma macro really just uh, is a way to build ES two thousand fifteen classes within them, and uh, this is kind of my first time writing any large or more complex macro with NIM. Um, I've done a little bit before, but um, I was mostly just like copying and pasting other people's macros and putting them together to um, to define some like NIM script hooks, I guess, so I could, I could kind of, uh, well, it's a different topic, it's not important. But what I'm doing here is I'm trying to provide an easy way for users to declare ES2015 classes without having to write a lot of uh, 
JavaScript, I guess. Um, so I found this library called Emerald, which is a, which is a NIM library. Um, I'll put out a link to it real quick. So Emerald is a HTML templating library, and it um, basically allows you to tag a NIM procedure with a pragma, and then in that pragma, or sorry, in that procedure, you can use a DSL to write HTML5. Um, you can. Uh, inject like NIM expressions and things like that. You can basically use NIM code. You can use branching logic, um, all sorts of nice things to... It, so I, I kind of viewed this as a alternative to JSX in a way. Um, obviously it's not all the way there. And then of course if I wanted to do something like template literals, we were still kind of missing the whole um, tag template thing, but I thought this was a great starting point in terms of uh, giving me a way to not have to write HTML um, inside my source code, but also be a way to, you know, easily, um, easily write, sorry, the dogs are driving me a little nuts this morning. Um, easily be able to uh, have a templating library for HTML. So that's kind of where Emerald comes uh, into play. There were some problems with Emerald though. Um, it only supports the C backend given the implementation that Flux provided because it uses the streams module. Um, so because it's a macro and it's going to just run at compile time and then disappear really, um, what I did was I just replaced all the stream stuff with strings and it works out fine. Um, there's a couple other limitations too, like since I'm using custom elements and I'm actually defining new HTML tags, the, hold on one second again please, I'm sorry. The room I'm in the door is like, there's a cable running into the jam so it's not closing all the way so the dogs keep barging in here and barking. Um, anyway, so Emerald, yeah, it didn't work with the, the JavaScript back and so I just like forked it and modified it to, to work with the JS back end which was pretty trivial. And then of course it doesn't support the, uh, the custom tags that I'm going to be showing you in a second. So, um, I, I made some more modifications to it and I'm actually still kind of working on that so that when I define my own um, custom element, which you can kind of see down here, I'm making this like lit app element, which is just um, a, a um, custom element that's going to be using this lit's library. Um, but when I define that, um, I, I'll be able to need to use that tag potentially inside my templating um, from Emerald and unless I you know fix that I won't be able to do that but I've gotten it to the point where I can hard code the tag and everything's fine um, you can see up here I'm kind of doing that with this navbar tag that I have but I haven't gotten to the point where when I declare a class and I define a custom element that the tag automatically gets um, added at compile time uh, to the uh, to the Emerald stuff, so that's still a work in progress. But I mean, I, I think it's totally doable. Um, it's just a little bit more work. Okay, so yeah, this this NES macro, it's a giant mess right now. It just needs to get split up. Basically, it's just all in one giant macro. Um, yeah, it's almost like 500 lines at this point, close to it. But uh. 
what it's essentially doing is it's it's probably a lot better if I um if I just run it and show you the output so you can see what it's doing. So let me do that now. Sorry, I was playing with the code last night. And... Okay. That's gonna want something. I'm just going to copy and paste this into uh, the new document so I can show you guys. It didn't work. Okay, so um, a couple things. I'm up here. I'm importing components in navbar, and this is. How I would imagine you might want to structure a um, an app with you know reusable custom elements or components. So I'm gonna close this and try to keep these side by side. So what the macro does is um, based on the class name you give it. Um, one second. Check on the string real quick. Oh yeah, the uh, well, I'm not sure about Emerald's license. Yeah, we'll have to uh, to ask Flix about that. Um, I'm not even sure what license it has right now. Uh, I think it has the <laughs> do what the fuck you want to do public license. <laughs> so I think you can uh. You can probably do whatever you want with it, and Flix probably doesn't give an F. In fact, I'm pretty sure when I talked to Flix, he said that um, he was surprised that I <laughs> that I actually like did anything with that library, and he said he didn't want to maintain it anymore. <laughs> so, so, I think it's kind of one of those things like use it your own discretion. But um, of course, like if if I end up using these libraries for my personal site and um, the NIM Playground, I'll be maintaining them as well as I do those libraries, which isn't very well either. But um, um anyway, yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Okay, so back to what the macro does. Um, yeah, the macro kind of gives you this like DSL, which I'm still not in love with um i really don't know what the best way to to structure kind of a um a macro like this is like i i played with pragmas at first <clears throat> and i didn't really love that because and and you know maybe maybe i should go back to that having gone kind of this like dsl route i've gone down now because i've learned a lot since then 
about um about what's possible and what I was doing wrong. Like first of all, what I was what I learned was um when I was writing the macro and I was relying on the Emerald library, Emerald Emerald by its default implementation produces a a type kind of like this you see up here on the left. And let me just rename this as a min file so we get some like syntax highlighting. It's not so ugly. Okay. So um, Emerald would emit a type for the, the template you create, and then it would emit like a new procedure that you could call at runtime. And what I well, wasn't clicking for me when I was doing all this, I really kind of like was in a coding binge and hadn't slept in a while, like a, you know, probably a day or so, and I was super tired. And um, it just wasn't clicking for me that Emerald was emitting values at runtime. And I was trying to access those values in my, excuse me, macro at compile time. So, I, you know, this isn't gonna work, obviously. <laughs> it's pretty much impossible. So once I realized that I changed Emerald to basically pass abstract syntax into my macro that I was writing. Um, but prior to doing that, I had been going about this whole class definition business in a much more, I guess, may maybe it's a more logical fashion, I'm not sure, but I would, I would make the user declare a new procedure for the, the class, the ECMAScript class that they wanted to create and um, they would have to tag it with a pragma called constructor. And I know a lot of people don't, don't like all these pragmas, but it, it wasn't as like blocky and DSL-ish as this. Um, and it only required you to really understand and know a couple pragmas, whereas this DSL now kind of requires you to know this whole custom structure. Um, not that the structure necessarily has to be in the same order, um, and I'll eventually document it, but I'm kind of going back and forth in my head about which approach I like better for writing this macro. But the idea is, <clears throat> um, up top you can, so first of all, you give the class a name. So in this, in this case, the class is going to be called navbar and the, the code that gets created by the macro will create a nim type and you can optionally you know, expose the type, um, which will expose the nim type in turn, and you can optionally give the class a parent type or a super type. Um, if you omit this, the base class is going to be. Give me one second, let me put the macro so I can remember. It's going to be. Um, ES2015 class, which is basically just a class that um, extends the JS object class, which is the uh, the base JS object in NIM if you're using the JSFFI backend or the JSFFI module, excuse me. Okay, so um, then the next step is um, you can optionally define properties beneath that. So it, it takes the macro takes in an untyped block, uh, which you just specify after this clone. Um, so inside that that block you can specify key value pairs. So you can say like uh, and if I compile this again you can see what happens. No, I don't want to do this because it's going to be a lot of back and forth and me copying and pasting stuff. Anyway, <clears throat> I'll just I'll just talk through the macro. Um, the implementation is not really important, and again, like if anyone has ideas about how this can be improved, I would love to hear them because I'm not really in, in love with this, but I'm not sure what a better way is to do this right now. Um, so obviously, like the it. 
ECMAScript 2015 classes by the specification have to have a constructor. Um, so by default, I'm going to just be um, calling, you know, this dot super inside the constructor. Um, I want to change this to basically work more like this where you would have um, constructor and it would just equal proc and it would emit your um, you know HTML element I guess or you might even I think we can just get away with nav bar here I'm just trying to think of like when we create the uh, the glue code that glues to the JavaScript code um, what types we'll be able to use and uh, then you would basically just define your your constructor body. Now the only weird thing about you know the differences between JavaScript and Nim is like in JavaScript, of course, you're going to have like this in context, um, and that's that's really the one thing I battled in this DSL um, or I've been battling is like how do you how do you deal with the fact that in Nim you know there is no this variable present um, that just doesn't exist, right? And because the block of code going into the macro is untyped, there's really no point in like introducing it um, or anything like that because the user's not going to be able to take advantage of it with inside the DSL. So I'm thinking maybe the the best way to do it is um, potentially just adding a variable here I don't know I'm really not sure or maybe creating ref types and, and having the user have to create the ref type that themselves inside the constructor but what I was doing was I was just allowing the user to place a constructor body inside this constructor body key or this constructor body um, block and um, they could use the this variable freely so bind lit is um, the equivalent of what I came up with with hyper HTML so um, if you open up the uh, the hyper HTML docs or the hyper HTML website that's that's the same thing as the bind function there that's basically gonna bind context to to the um, template literal um, <clears throat> in this case it's gonna be the this variable that's um, in the context of our our, H, our ECMAScript 2015 class. Um, so then here we're starting to define a HTML template using that Emerald library. Um, so we're just creating like a nav element. Um, and with that Emerald library, we can assign classes. And this is just using that DSL that the Emerald library provides. Um, so if you're familiar at all with React uh, or web components, React has like component lifecycle hooks so that you can um, you know, do different things during, during the component's lifecycle. Like uh, when the component comes online, um, you, know, you can do some state initialization or you know, set up some event handlers, you know, whatever you want to basically. Web components has something similar in the custom element spec. Um, so custom elements have a, a connected callback and I think a disconnected callback. So you can do things at component initialization and you can do things when components are deinitialized. Or I, I guess that's really when they first appear in the DOM and when they're removed from the DOM. Um, so in this case, we're just telling our nav bar to render. Um, and then, of course, we have a render procedure. So if you were using a state management library, that's probably when this would come into play. Um, since this is my personal website, I'm probably not going to need a lot of state management. I don't even think I'm going to have much dynamic content, probably. Um, so I can just get away with telling the component to render. Um, in fact, I haven't even really written anything in here. I'm going to show you guys some more complete examples that I've written with some of these libraries so you guys can see the idea behind them. Um, in a more, I guess, complete way. But um, yeah, I'm probably not gonna have much dynamic content at all in here. So um, I can just get away with calling, you know, telling the components to render here. It's not gonna need to re-render when, when things change. Um, 
Okay, so tag custom element is the basically the um, way I came up with tagging uh, literals. Um, so in the lits library I'm working on, I have like two or three different tag procedures. Uh, I've tried to differentiate them by name, but you can tag just a literal with a procedure. You can tag, or a temple literal rather, with a procedure. You can tag a custom element with a procedure. Um, meaning, like, if you've created a template and you want to have that template um, specify the um, markup for a custom element, that's the procedure you would use. And there's one other I can't remember, but. Um, I'll show it to you momentarily. I'm going to plug in my laptop. Just give you one moment, please. Charger's over here. Okay, um, so I'm going to close this nav bar, go back to the, uh, the explaining I was doing about what the macro produces. So, um, just jump along with me. Okay, so whenever you declare a class with a macro, um, it's going to create a, a type, and it's going to create a, a reference object, um, or a ref type, and it's going to inherit, optionally inherit from, like I said earlier, uh, whatever super class you specify, if you specify one, or it's going to just inherit from ES2015 class, um, so in this case, HTML element is, uh, right, that's actually from the DOM module, so we can just import the DOM module and extend from HTML element that way. Um, the macro is also going to create a new procedure for you, um, and it's eventually going to emit some JavaScript, um, let me try to show you that down here. Now, again, this macro has some work to do, especially in terms of getting indentation right and things like that. Okay, so um, this new navbar procedure is going to use the import CPP pragma to call the new navbar JavaScript function, and this is how you when you're talking about ES two thousand fifteen classes. This is how you um, create a new instance of a class. So we're just going to simply bind to that and that'll be called whenever we call new navbar. Um, the thing is when we when we want to use this um, define procedure right here, which I've I've imported from um, JavaScript, uh, this is in the custom element specification in version one of the web component specification. Uh, this is how you define custom elements. Um, 
you need to pass a function pointer basically to the constructor um, to the custom element registry so whenever I in the macro am creating a new class I also create this variable and I'll just call it you know whatever the the object or whatever you call the, the the Mac, you know, sorry, whatever you call the class when you invoke the macro, I'll just depend constructor to that and create that variable. Um, it needs to be exported, all these do, but I'm just getting started to work on, on exporting things. That was something I just started on the other day. Um, and it's basically just going to bind to the, uh, to the JavaScript, um, object constructor, um, or the class constructor rather. And then <clears throat> it's going to create a basically a procedure for any um so hunting for a file here and pulling up the wrong one. So I guess like in in JavaScript, um, any method you, that gets attached to the class or procedure is called a prototype method in JavaScript. So what I'm allowing to happen in the macro is you can just declare a Really, you can do this with any kind of property. So for instance, here we're creating a property called template. Here we're creating one connected callback, and here we're creating one called render. And then you just basically assign a value to that property. Um, it can be a procedure. It can be, like in this case, it's a template produced by the Emerald library. But that's basically the way you use the macro to attach prototype methods or member properties to the class that gets produced. So what will happen is um, a NIM procedure will be produced called, like in this case it's called connected callback. Um, it will receive a a single argument um, and it will be, the argument will be of the, basically the, the object representing like this in JavaScript, right? And then um, it will just be bound to the JavaScript method um, that we emit with the macro later on. And then obviously you can see the same thing happens here with the, uh, with the render prop. Now I'm still in the process of like converting all the, the different types of expressions and, you know, things that you could potentially supply in the body of, of these, um, properties or whatever. Um, but, uh, that's a work in progress. But you, you can kind of see how the macro creates stub stub nim um, types and procedures and then just binds them to the JavaScript that it eventually creates. Uh, this template stuff here is all from Emerald, really. So this is just it kind of creating the template um, and the, the HTML that the template produces. And then here is the JavaScript that actually we create just to be a MIT pragma. So we'll create a JavaScript class. It'll extend HTML element. We'll have a constructor that we'll call super. Um, it'll assign, excuse me. It'll assign what got stored in this uh, template from the like modified Emerald code I um, produced. Um, it'll use the bind lit procedure from the, the lits library to basically bind uh, this into the context of of the literal. That way, in the literal, we could do something like potentially, like say, like um, close this. If we had, for instance, inside this nav bar a h1, we could do something like. I'm just going to grab something from another example I have. So we could potentially just do something like this. Uh, it is new date to local time string, um, although this isn't really, really showing me that I had 
what I was trying to do, but let's say like, um, let's say the class had a property on it called, uh, or a function on it called foo, right? We could just call this dot foo, and this would be bound to that template literal. So it would know what foo is and be able to call foo. And then of course, like foo would have to be a you know, method here. Something like that, right? Um, hopefully, you get the idea. This makes a lot more sense, by the way, if you understand the concept of tag temple literals and if you if you understand what hyper HTML does and, and how that all works. But hopefully, some of you guys get the uh, get the gist of what I'm talking about. And if you don't, feel free to ask questions. Um, but um. <clears throat> I'm trying to bounce back and forth between Twitch and see if anyone's asking questions or not. Um, but it looks pretty silent right now, so that's that's good. Hopefully that means people are understanding. Okay, so um, the last procedure that gets emitted by the JavaScript is the render procedure. And really we're just kind of copying and pasting what's in the body there. The only difference is like we're replacing n.html since you know, since this is actually type min code, even though it's going into an untyped macro, um, I have to replace any references to n here, any like dot expressions with this dot um, in the JavaScript code that gets emitted. So that's the concept behind the macro. It's so that we can, given a DSL or whatever life form the <laughs> macro ends up you know taking however it eventually ends up looking and working whatever implementation the goal is to create nim code that binds to javascript code that it emits and then now you can now let me get into actual working examples of things since this this uh personal website is just kind of my playground project at the moment um so in the lits project, I have a test. And I'm pretty sure this should still work for the most part. So let's give it a, I think I've broken too many things in the past couple of days. Let's see here. Cool, it says it works. So. Even better, a test pass. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, yeah, so this is kind of the meat of the uh, the Lits library. And the Lits library uses the NES macro, so this will kind of give you a better idea of what you can do with these libraries. Um, okay, so in the first example, what I've done is oh yeah, sure, um, I'm on a MacBook Pro, so let me um, hmm. and I type really loudly, I know, so I can understand that and I'm on one of these stupid new MacBooks that has like the extremely shallow keyboards. So I'm guessing that uh, when I type, it's it's pretty loud. Let me try to figure out a way to um, to fix that. Maybe if I just move the screen closer and try to not type as loud, this will go better. Um, and I'll try to speak up as well too. So. In, um, I'm just going to post a link real quick. I wish I could... Let me just add another window here. That way you guys don't have to have your browsers up. Alright. 
Cool. Is that working? Yeah, awesome. Just way too zoomed in. Alright, hopefully this zoom is okay. Um, what I want to show you is in Hyper HTML. I want to show you the example. So I give you, first of all, so you guys don't just think I'm like making shit up that <laughs> somebody else is actually doing this and I'm just not wasting your time. Um, and the second thing is to, to kind of give you the JavaScript implementation to follow along with. Um, so you have some point of reference to come from, and I see that the, uh, the window isn't really centered here, so let me try to move that over. I don't think that worked out like I wanted it to. All right, I'll just maximize it and hopefully you guys can kind of see. Um, in fact, maybe I'll just copy and paste this all into VS Code. Then we don't have to worry about Chrome. All right, cool. That works. But I think I have to do this now. I really need to get something better than this OBS software. But... Alright. <clears throat> um. Hold on one second, I'm trying to respond to some of these messages. Okay, so this is just a small example, and if you're coming from any kind of React background, you can probably understand what's going on here. Um, up top, we have a JavaScript const, and it's basically just returning some JSX. Right, or it's assigning some JSX. Um, so that JSX has some dynamic content in it, namely this this date right here, which will potentially change. Um, so this is going to force you know a re-render in React every time that date changes, and then. You're we're using the React DOM library to to render that JSX, um, and we're using a root in, root element inside uh, our document object model. So So we have the hyper HTML equivalent um, down here at the bottom. Um, so this is the whole concept behind like tagging a template literal, right? You you have a function, and here we have the the render function, and that's being supplied um, in in this tick function, right? It's being passed in. And then inside here we have a we have a template literal, and you can see we have the we have the same um, date expression there, the same two local time string call. Right. So in this case we have uh, the same dynamic content, but what's different about React? How React and HyperHTML is going to handle this is like React is going to diff this whole 
the potentially like the whole you know domain object model um or the, at least the whole virtual dom for changes um and you know if you're a good react programmer um you can alleviate a lot of this by using lifecycle hooks and telling things when to render and when not to re-render and things like that but hyper html alleviates a lot of this for you because what's going to happen behind the scenes in hyper html is this is going to get tagged so that hyper html knows its dynamic content and then when there's still a, a diffing operation that happens but when that different diffing operation happens um it's only looking at content that's been tagged it's not examining all of the content so the diff's supposed to be much faster and thusly less things are getting manipulated so um and maybe not less things are getting manipulated but since the i i don't know that's that's one of the reported performance benefits again like i haven't seen any benchmarks around these libraries I, i'm sure there are some out there if you really want to explore but i'm not a huge fan of react for a number of reasons um and uh google's also porting this library too their port's called like lit html uh, but they're tying it into their whole polymer framework which is like their their uh framework to push you know web components um Hyper HTML is much more like framework agnostic. It really just focuses around rendering uses ta using tag template literals. That, that's that's why I decided that it was probably worth a worth a port. Um, okay, and then down here at the bottom, in both examples, you can see you know he's calling the the built-in set interval function, which I think exists on like the window object in JavaScript, and um, so every every second basically tick's gonna get invoked. So the difference between the examples is the uh, the third argument getting past the set interval um, is so he's calling hyper HTML dot bind and then he's um passing in a a selector uh, which is gonna grab the root element. So hyper HTML has its own bind method. Uh, which I think when I was showing you those examples earlier, the new code you saw is called like bind lit. It's the same idea, or bind, you know, custom element. Um, no, wait, hold on. There was tag custom element and there was bind lit. So bind lit is my equivalent of hyper HTML.bind, where you basically um, supply an element, and then what happens behind the scenes is it just calls that uh, bind on the the render function supplied by hyper HTML or you know in my uh, in my library and the element that's um, supplied to the bind call is uh, what supplied to the built-in you know bind function on that or sorry, the uh, the render function that I just spoke to earlier. In fact, I can show you the implementation real quick. It's pretty simple. Um, I'll show you the JavaScript implementation. So, because that's probably a little bit easier to read than my um, uncleaned up mem one. Right, so when hyper HTML bind gets called, context is going to be that that DOM element I just spoke to, and this is just going to uh, there's a render function up here somewhere right here, right? So it's going to have a it's going to bind to that render function the uh, the element that you passed in. So that way, when tick is invoked you have access to that render function and then hyper html can do its thing in terms of diffing the and uh diffing the you know dynamic content and then going on to manipulate the dom so that's how hyper html kind of works under the hood and the nice the really nice thing about hyper html um, if you go and check out that website and then you go to the examples is they have examples on how to basically build um, any kind of component you would 
you might build in React today, or you might build in Angular, or you might build in Polymer, or Vue.js, or Marco, and they give you an example of how you could potentially do it in HyperHTML. Now, um, if you don't know a ton about um, about custom elements and web components, um, you know they're they're not really one to one with React. Um, they don't provide any state management capabilities. So web components don't even have localized component state, for instance. I mean, they have like, um, you know, they have properties that you can associate with the ECMAScript 2016 or 15 class rather, but they certainly don't have, um, you know, state like a React component does. And there's nothing like a store that you could potentially get from Redux or something like that. So if you want to use web components instead of React and you want to use a library like HyperHTML, um, you really need to supply your own library or something that's analogous to component local and app state if you're going to need such a thing. But if your use case is just like mine, for instance, where you just want to make a, a personal website and you don't have a lot of dynamic content, and um, you don't need, you know, application state and things like that, then you can probably get away without it. But um, I, I don't see any reason why you couldn't plug in something like MobX or, or Redux or something like that to, uh, to these libraries. Um, okay, so I'm probably just going to do maybe like 15 to 20 more minutes and then probably end the stream early because... Um, I don't have a lot of like things ready to start coding. I'm not that I, I, I haven't gotten to, to that point of organization with things yet. A lot of this is still exploratory and I'm still adding features, but I did want to um just kind of give an introductory stream to what I'm doing because I'm hopefully gonna be trying to stream more regularly about a couple topics. Uh, and I'll talk about that before I, I cut things off. But um Okay, so let's Let's go back to the NIM code where I've kind of re-implemented this example. Um, all right. So we using that the the macro, right? We have a um I'm just gonna check the chat real quick, I think. No, no, I'm going over NIM code right now. <laughs> Um, I just don't think I'm going to write any NIM code today. Um, I mean, w we can if you guys really want to, but <laughs> I'll just go over things I have written. And we have reviewed some, we reviewed some earlier in the stream. No, this isn't using Carex. This is, um, so let me talk, let me talk about Carex. Um, I think Carex is fine and, and I think it's a, it's a good library. Um, I've used I use it on the the first version of the playground that I built. I do think that um, I've run into some issues in the past using Carex um, that I didn't find clean workarounds for. I guess um, so. One was kind of like the idea of being able to. I guess, okay, so I'll give you a, a problem use case. Um, when I was implementing the playground, I was using Ace Editor. And Ace Editor is a, is a third party script that had to be loaded prior to uh, Carax doing its thing. Um, the way I really included it was just like I, I had a, another JavaScript file that I loaded up. Um, but really the problem was I needed to use the the element that Carax created um, with the ace editor. So it, if that makes sense, like Carax is producing a bunch of HTML and sticking that into the domain object model. And then I need to use an element inside that document fragment that Carax has produced um, and pass that to to Ace Editor's JavaScript, um, and I, I think like 
um, Dominic had this issue too when he was working on the form, and I think that he kind of worked around it with using kind of like a timeout, um, which is definitely a way you can solve the problem. You know, you just basically like wait until Carax renders the document fragment, and then you have your A set editor or whatever code that you need to you need that document fragment to be there. Um, have it run then, but um, that was one issue I had. And then another thing was because I, I stumbled upon this whole um, template literal, you know, approach to tag template literal, literal approach to um, to doing the presentation layer rendering, layer rendering, and I, I saw there was, you know, some steam behind it and the fact that Google had ported um, this idea to lit HTML and they were playing with the concept. I talked to some coworkers at work too, and uh, several of them were were pretty um, excited about the concept. Um, and these are guys that like you know they all they really know is like CSS and JavaScript and they love it and you know that's that's what they do all day. So the fact that some of them were buying into uh, to this approach to to presentation, taking care of the presentation layer, you know got me uh, got me excited about the concept but having now implement you know having ported it um, and I understand you know 90% of hyper HTML's code at this point and I've gone through it uh, line for line pretty much um, you know, I don't see a ton of advantages like I, I see advantages to both approaches um, you know the the virtual Dom and the Dom diffing I think um, I don't even know if I want to go so far as to say like one safer in terms in terms of making sure that there's like no inconsistencies in your you know your UI and your app state um, because I, I really don't think that can happen with hyper HTML too at least the approach that the the JavaScript library takes and as long as I haven't screwed things up too badly the uh, the port will provide but um you know the the claim that hyper HTML is just supposed to be magnitudes faster than you know the traditional approach of um, of DOM diffing and uh, using a virtual DOM, you know, made at least in my mind the concept worth exploring. But I guess I guess the uh, the benchmarks that are out there, if there are any, will I mean, as we all kind of discuss pretty frequently, benchmarks are kind of stupid and, and often don't really. Um, provide the whole truth behind things but uh it's a it's at least a different approach to to doing things and um it's an interesting one so let me get back to um to the ported examples real quick so um in fact i can All right, so you can kind of have the hyper HTML and the, uh, the JavaScript side by side. Don't worry about that for now. Let's just focus on this this first test. Um, so again, we're going to need a a <clears throat> JavaScript class or an ES two thousand fifteen class. So we use that class macro I showed you earlier. We're going to call our class uh, ticker. Um, we're not creating a, an element here, um, just like they're not here. You, you can see there's no like new custom element inside the uh, the HTML markup, or the the HTML rather. Um, and so we're so the difference between what I showed you earlier and, and this is that we're first of all we're not exposing this, so there's no we're not exporting it, so there's no export marker. And then uh, the second thing is we're not extending from any class. Um, and so I showed you that earlier, so we're not doing that either. Um, the the NES macro I wrote provides a couple classes by, or provides the ES2015 class by default, which is just a ref object of, or, or sorry, of just object, right? Um, 
So if you don't provide a super class, that will be the the class by default that yours inherits from. Um, okay. Then we have uh, this again. This whole like idea of being able to just say this is a member property on this class, and then this is its value. So we're going to use that HTML template pragma from Emerald. Now, if you look at the Emerald docs, like you'll you'll see normally you're using Emerald like uh, kind of like this, and then you're giving it a pragma here, right? So that worked great um, for Flix when he when he wrote Emerald and you know he was using all this stuff at runtime, um, but for me I needed a I needed Flix's HTML template macro to produce just abstract syntax that I could use in my class macro, um, and not a bunch of you know code that I could use at runtime. So in my modified version, uh, you just call the macro and then provide this untyped block here. So this is still using this, I mean, the internals of the library didn't really change besides the fact that it's using a string instead of the strings he was using. Um, so this is going to create a div element and then just like we have here and then um, this is just me playing around with uh, being able to assign um, attributes to the to the HTML element that it creates but you don't have to do that. You can just use D. Um, Okay, and then here we're creating a header one element and a header two, and then we're gonna have this uh, this template literal in here, or this template in here. Um, <clears throat> so here you can see that uh, I showed you guys earlier that when like, the macro gets run, it creates the, the job, it emits the JavaScript code, and then it creates the nim, the nim glue code. I can run it again real quick and show you. Um, so the Nimble packages, they're not published on Nimble yet, um, because they're very much works in progress, but they're on GitHub. Um, oh, 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 sorry, you're talking about the, uh, the tag template literal library I'm using. It's, uh, Emerald. Uh, and I have a link for it, just give me one second. libraries that I, I'm working on that I mentioned, which are very incomplete, but I'll post links to them real quick just so people can look at them if they have questions. So this is the um the tag template literal library and then that is the the ECMAScript macro. Okay. Um, so now we're. <clears throat> oh yeah, sorry. I have a I have all that stuff on my clipboard. Oh, I thought I did. <laughs> sorry, I have really bad ADHD. If you can't tell. <laughs> um, okay. So. Yeah, the uh, the class gets created, and this is the code that gets emitted. Again, here's really the the JavaScript that we're creating down here, and the JavaScript is pretty pretty empty in this case. It's just assigning the template that gets created. 
Um, and that's all this code here, really. Um, into the ticker template property of the class. Um, because that's what we've named the property here, right? So this was really all the code that Emerald already produced. I mean, I didn't have to do much changing to Emerald. I just had to replace the whole uh, concept of using strings with a string. And I had to, I think, add a third cache variable before it was just using two. Just different things like that. I also had to like make it produce a C string since, and I should probably just use K string from Carex for all of this, but um, I haven't gotten that far yet. Um, so now we have you know a, a nim procedure we can call, which we're calling right here in the example. And then if we go back to the hyper HTML code, we can call. Um, we can make this this tick procedure or this tick function right and then um, and then there we can call the uh, the tag template procedure from the lits library that I'm working on which is essentially the equivalent of doing this right here like this is the whole concept of tagging a literal right like you have a function called a render and you're tagging this literal with it so in here we're tagging our template which is our uh the ticker template property on our ticker object or instance of our class and we're going to tag it with r which if you look in this example r is equivalent or you know equivalent to render right and it's getting passed into this tick procedure and uh the last step to all of this is to do the window set interval call and uh, we're just going to pass it an anonymous procedure here um, and basically just like they call bind and pass in the root element um, we'll do the same thing here but instead of passing in root we're just going to pass in the document body element and um, yeah, I think the where the only difference here is like they're not using an anonymous procedure in here and in, and I am. Um, but let me show you what this looks like when you open this up in the browser. Okay, so basically this is ticking every second and that dynamic content's changing. Um, actually we can better we probably do like that. And we can we can look at the HTML. It's going to be kind of hard to see because it's constantly being re rendered. But, like, you can see, like, even inside this div, like, this stuff's not changing. It's just that the content in that H2, um, and I have a couple other, um, examples here so really what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to port each of the examples hyper HTML has where they're comparing things with react and Marco and polymer and Vue.js and all these other frameworks um, and I can even you know once I have time and um, I can compare things with Carex too if people would like that um, but I've only gotten through a couple of examples so far. So um, in HyperHTML, they have a uh, 
the idea of be, being able to find like a, a basic component as a class, but not have a custom element. Um, so there's going to be no new, you know, markup introduced. Sorry if I've gotten quiet again. I uh, moved the monitor away from my uh, my face, but um. Hold on one second, please. I gotta stop these dogs. Hey! Stop that! Stop barking. No barking. Sorry about that. It's a zoo in here. Um. Hey, stop. Um, so, yeah, no new markup, but um, we're going to create a, a class here. Um, I guess really the difference between this example and the other one is... So... Here we're we're gonna have this properties um, object, which is of a uh, of type welcome props, which I've defined up here, and that's gonna be a member of this class welcome. And um, I talked about this a while ago, but I, I was kind of explaining how you know JavaScript has one one difference between JavaScript and NIM. Um, it's not really a difference. It's just like the the NIM backend, you know, the NIM JavaScript backend doesn't have any concept of uh, of this like JavaScript does, right? So like, normally you would create a variable called you know named whatever you want to. You can call it like self or you know back ticket and put this in there. You can even name it this, and then you would import C the the JavaScript this variable, right? And that's normally how you would bind to this in uh, the JavaScript this using NIM, but um, I was talking about how you know in the DSL there's you know there's no really great way to reflect the fact that there is a this at least I haven't thought of one yet. So um, but I was also talking about how in a tag template literal you know if it's if it's on a class or if uh, once it gets bound you can refer to the this variable. So in, in this instance like and sorry about the whole card facts or car fox <clears throat> crap in here I was I was using this for work at one point so uh, that's why that's in here but um um the idea here is like when this renders you know this value from this um object is going to get uh, interpolated into into this template um so that would be analogous to the second example in in hyper html if you're looking at that page yes <laughs> dogs dogs do love to be bugged um let's see here oh and i'm cr i'm sorry i was i had the wrong window up the entire time i was just talking now i meant to have this window up <laughs> So this is what I was talking about, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, in the in the template you can see it's referring to this here. And let me go ahead and just recompile this real quick. So um So in this example there's nothing being rendered to the page but you can see I'm just console logging the uh the output um you can see right here in the example, the last 
uncommented line. It's just logging the render uh, method. Um, but you can see that it uh, it provided the value there in the string that was assigned to the number property of that class. And um, that's kind of how HyperHTML and I, you know, I stole the same implementation. Um, it basically just like comments the uh, as a comment to the HTML markup, and then it uses a bunch of regular expressions when it diffs to go and find what it needs to diff. I don't make any claims about how performant it is or anything, but I mean, it seems to work and. Um, I looked through Google's implementation just to make sure like they weren't doing anything vastly different in uh in lit HTML and it looks like they're pretty much doing mostly the same thing. Um the main difference between lit HTML and hyper HTML is lit HTML has it's written in TypeScript first of all. Um and it doesn't have nearly as many features as hyper HTML, and I'm not sure if that's purposeful or not. If like Google needed a less streamlined version than this guy did, or a more streamlined version rather. Um, but yeah, there's that. Okay, so um, I'll go to the last example really quickly here. And let me just, again, put the code back up. Someone sent a message in here. Nope, not now. Good. Okay. So this last example is us introducing some custom markup. Um, so kind of like what I was showing you guys at first with the the personal project I'm working on, where like I was creating a nav bar, but nothing was really implemented yet I was just kind of talking through the uh, the libraries and how kind of how they work conceptually and how they're they're kind of all building on this concept basically here what we're gonna do is we're gonna create our own I guess like welcome element right like kind of like we'd create a component in react and then be able to use that in our markup so um, we're going to create a class called welcome and it's going to extend HTML element. Um, and um, so one thing I did with the with the macro is like before you um you have a constructor body and I'll probably eventually end up changing this to you because I'm not a huge fan of it. Um, I'll probably just go back to being able to declare a constructor like this and figure out a way to handle the absence of this in a better way but um what I did at first was I was saying that you could like specify arguments uh, up here um, that would then be passed on to the constructor so in this case we have um, a constructor argument called args and it's going to be a veridic number of uh, JS objects and then um we have our constructor body and what that's doing, it's basically doing the, um, I guess we haven't seen it so far in this example, but the idea is it's going to take the, uh, it's going to add a HTML property to this JavaScript object or class, and then it's going to assign the output of a call to bind lit, passing in the this variable inside JavaScript. Um, so basically, when, this is kind of like, what we were doing up here, passing document body to this template. So when this template resolves, or when you know the expression in here is interpolated, like this is going to be the equal to the instance of this welcome object that we've created, right? So that's that's what we're doing there. Um, so then we have a property called welcome template, and again we're using the the modified version of Emerald to. Uh, basically say like when this template gets rendered create HTML for a, a header one element with this content and again we have some dynamic content where we're gonna try to get a a attribute uh, called name from this element so you know when you're writing HTML well you can see it down here 
Like if we're writing HTML, right? Like oftentimes tags have attributes on them and provide values. So this might be class or this might be ID or something. In this case, we're just saying name, right? So uh, then we have, um, since we're using custom elements now, we can hook into their lifecycle callbacks. Uh, so just like React elements have, or React components have lifecycle callbacks, custom elements in the web components spec do too. Um, so here we're using the connected callback, which is basically when the element gets inserted into the DOM. And what we want to have there is we want our uh, our welcome object to render, right? And then so now we need a render procedure. And then um, here we're going to basically, uh, I mentioned three methods earlier, I think three different types of like tagging you can do. You can just basically like tag a literal, um, uh, oh yeah, the other one is like, so um, so far we've just talked about like binding. Um, I, I did kind of sneakily show it up here in this in this basic component example. Um, uh, enabled some multi-selection funk in DS Studio. Okay, so uh, along with this whole bind business that HyperHTML has, um, there's also this thing called wire which is another, um, uh, I guess, API function they introduce. And um, the difference between wire and render is like, if you want to introduce new, um, what's the word I'm looking for? If you want to create like a new element inside your document objects model, you use bind. If you want to wire a literal to, or, now I'm using the, the function name, but if you want to basically attach a literal uh, to an existing HTML element, you use wire. So that's why there's three different versions of tag. There's tag like we're using up here in the first example. Oops, sorry. There's a fly buzzing around this room, and like now my dog's trying to uh, attack the fly. <laughs> this whole animal thing is getting out of control. Um, okay, so up here in the first example, right, we're using, uh, we're using one instance of the tag. We're just saying tag template, and we're just passing in, uh, basically the, um, well, we're passing in the, the method that gets passed in here, the, or the render procedure, and the, uh, the template that's attached to this, um, ticker class, right, or ticker object. So that's one instance of tag. We're just trying to tag a, a template literal basically with a function. Um, but then in the second example I, example I talked about, um, we're still not really trying to introduce any new like document fragment or any new you know object into our domain object model. We're really just tagging our uh, template um, and then we want to produce, we want to modify an existing element, basically. Um, so that's why we have the second version of tag. And that's where we can use the, the wire function that HyperHTML comes with, that my port also includes. And you can probably get a, let me open up the, um, hi Lazarus, I'm well, thank you, how are you doing? Sorry, I'm kind of a, bouncing back and forth between code and um, and I'm trying to pay attention to the stream chat but I don't have the most the best streaming interface set up yet so please uh, please bear with me um, so yeah let me um, open up hyper HTML's docs real quick and probably explain it a little bit better than I can just give me one moment Okay. So yeah, we want to um. Whenever you want to create a container, instead of populating one, or when you want to create some DOM content at runtime, uh, wire is the way to go. So, as we saw in that second example, when I ran it like. 
we didn't actually you know, see anything render to the page. We were just producing a, a header one tag with some dynamic content in it, right? So that's the second version of tag. And then this third version of tag, and the only reason there's different versions and I call them different things is just because, um, well, first of all, there was quite a bit of challenge in figuring out how to, how to get template literals working. Like if you look in JavaScript, um, template literals are constructed with backticks and backticks like wreck havoc on NIMS import CPP pragma. Um, so when you're emitting JavaScript in NIM uh, and you're using the emit pragma, right? Like if you have a, a NIM, and please, if I misspeak on any of this stuff, feel free to correct me, guys, because you know, I, I often mean to say one thing, but I say something else because just because I'm not, you know, uh, up the snuff on terminology all the way. But um, when you're using the, the JavaScript backend, and you have a variable, like oftentimes the, the compiler when it produces the JavaScript code, the variable name gets mangled, right? So like if you if you have a variable called like foo in, in your NIM source code, well, that variable in the JavaScript that NIM produces might be called like foo underscore one, two, three, four or something, for instance, right? Like the, the identifier name is no longer the same. So when you're emitting JavaScript and you want to refer to a variable that's inside your NIM code, you often would use like backticks to to make it so that the NIM compiler knows to use the the JavaScript identifier and not the the NIM identifier, right? So, but this produces problems because like if if you're trying to, for instance, um, bind to some JavaScript function, let's say, and you want the the caller of that function, you want to escape that in backticks, well that wreaks havoc on the import CPP pragma and just causes it to get injected into the generated JavaScript. So I played for like days trying to figure out how to how to get um, template literals working with NIM and the really only thing I could come up with which is really really ugly and I need to find a better way of doing I'll show you really quickly. It's right here. <laughs> so basically what I'm doing is um. Uh, calling JavaScript's eval, which is actually really, really not safe at all, but you can, you can essentially do the same thing by just like calling new function. But um, the way I'm, <laughs> the way I'm doing this is I'm like taking the first argument when tag gets called, which is generally the uh, the thing that I I want to tag, or the function I want to tag the element with, right? And then, um, so I'm calling that function and I'm passing in the second argument and then inside uh, this whole mess I'm um, using the backticks to construct the the template literal and then of course like because I'm trying to not use the the keyword this in this DSL um, oh I'm sorry the reason I'm doing that is because um inside the template you might refer to you know the JavaScript variable this, but um, this and this isn't the, I guess the same like, um, inside this procedure as it is. Um, I'm trying to think of the best way to explain this. It's a it's a little bit difficult of a concept to uh, to grasp unless you've like dug into this code and you've been knee deep in it. Um, and, and I have a feeling that's due to the way I implemented the code, not due to the fact that this is really a problem. I think it's just a problem I created for myself, in other words. But um, the whole concept behind this right here is uh, the this keyword in the template needs to get replaced with the actual variable name. So that's why this is happening here, or the very you know the the object the variables identifier. Um, but yeah, that's basically how I went about constructing template literals in in JavaScript with them. And it's horrible, but the backticks thing caused a lot of a lot of headache. Because like backticks are used pretty extensively in NIM for, for escaping keywords and things like that. Um so I can understand totally why the problem exists, but the fact that they're used for this in JavaScript and 
you know, if I if I had had something like um, here, like back to var dot, you know, and then I tried to tried to call a nim function that was bound to JavaScript like this using import cpp, just everything broke. Like inside my JavaScript, I'd suddenly see this being emitted, you know, which made no sense. I, I could just see that the backticks were, were breaking the functionality of the the import CPP pragma. So that was how I worked around that problem. But um getting back to the example, um I don't know, I have to look at that example in a minute. Eric, I'm sure like I said, I'm sure there's a a better way. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't it doesn't sound or look easy to easy to fix. I'm not like it it's a very complicated problem. I can totally understand. Um or at least from my perspective it was. <laughs> I can totally understand why why having a and it's not even really a problem, like if you think about it, because it's like, okay, one language uses this, one, one language has this style or this, you know, design or this approach to handling this construct, and another language uses that exact same syntactical, you know, element or syntactical construct for achieving, you know, something else. So I think it's just like a clash of a, a clash of syntax, if you will. But um. That that uh, whole thing can definitely be improved upon and, and should be improved upon, but at least it's it's working at this point, and that's the important thing because that allows us to do this whole uh, tag template thing. So now the the meat of this example is is down here, um, where what we're basically doing is we're just grabbing a root element that exists in the domain object model. And if I um, if I open up the example HTML file, we have this div root right here. So that's the div we're going to be selecting. And then I'm calling the tag template function, which is again just you know constructing the template literal and tagging it with a with a procedure. And we're passing in um, a bunch of just HTML that is going to use our custom element and it's going to supply a different value to that name attribute in each instance of the custom tag. So what we hopefully end up with is like three different h1 tags using our new custom element and the name is going to be either Sarah or Kahal or Aditi. <laughs> no, I didn't come up with these names. <laughs> and um in the ht in the uh, render document, so let's give it a whirl, and let's see here. Yeah, there we go. Cool. So we have our um, we have our tag template literals working, and our custom elements. So I think I'm going to start wrapping things up now. Um, if anyone has any questions or, or um, wants any information or anything like that, feel free to ask. I'm going to try to um, start streaming more regularly. I'm, um, I'm kind of in job hunt mode at the moment, so I'm using this as an excuse to get these libraries in shape and uh, get my personal website and um, and see the up to date and all that good stuff and then I'll be uh, I'll be trying to do some streams not only on web development but also on um, game development because I want to get back into working on uh, some game projects with them I haven't decided exactly what I want to do yet um, whether I want to do something as ambitious as I was as I was doing before where I was trying to build an engine or if I want to just try to actually do something achievable <laughs> that I might actually be able to finish it finish one day. But um either way I'll uh I'll post updates on Twitter in in uh the IRC channel or getter of NIM when I uh when I do 
decide to live stream. Hopefully, I'm I'm talking like once a week, maybe. Um, if I if I can achieve that, maybe once every two weeks is more realistic. But I'm gonna aim for once every week. But we'll see what happens. But uh, thanks a lot, everybody, for attending. Sorry if it was a little rough. It's my I streamed like Star Wars Galaxy emulator a couple of years ago, but I don't do this regularly, and I, I haven't done it in a while. So. Thanks for attending and bearing with me, and um, if you have any questions, just hit me up on Twitter or uh, or the NIM IRC channel, because I'm usually in it. Alright, thanks a lot, guys.